Hi, this is Dr. Kingston, and in this video, we're going to talk about the sympathetic nervous system. We are primarily going to be talking about how the sympathetic nervous system is structured. And to do this, we're going to talk about the three basic pathways preganglionics can take. We'll talk about the major sources of sympathetics to the head and neck and talk about how they travel to reach where they're going. And then we will briefly talk about Horner syndrome, its symptoms, and how it relates to sympathetic innervation. To start with, we're going to do a very, very quick review. Central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system consists of the nerves that carry innervation out to the peripheral body and internal viscera. The peripheral nervous system has two major divisions. We have the somatic nervous system, which is for conscious bodily functions like movement and detecting sensation from outside. Um, and that is going to employ a single neuron out in the periphery. The autonomic nervous system controls the unconscious function of organs and glands and uses a two neuron chain out in the periphery. The two neurons in an autonomic pair are referred to as preganglionic and postganglionic. The preganglionic neuron is rooted with its cell body in the central nervous system and sends out its axon along a peripheral nerve. It meets up with the postganglionic neuron in an autonomic ganglion. So remember, a ganglion is just a cluster of neuron cell bodies or soma outside of the central nervous system. And then after they synapse in that ganglion, the postganglionic neuron is what carries the autonomic impulse to the target organ or target structure. Within the autonomic nervous system, there are two motor divisions. We have sympathetic and parasympathetic. We covered parasympathetic in a previous video, so we're just going to focus on sympathetic here. Sympathetic is often referred to as the fight or flight system because it produces responses in the body that get you really amped up and ready to go. It originates from the spinal cord between spinal levels T1 and L2, occasionally L3, but we're going to stick with T1 to L2 for our guideline. And because of this, it is said to have thoracolumbar outflow. Now, when we were talking about parasympathetics, we find out that ganglia could look very different based on what structures they were headed to. So especially a lot of thoracic and abdominal organs had ganglia right in their walls. With sympathetics, this middle example here, this guy, um, is how all pathways work. So the preganglionic axon exits the central nervous system to find a standalone ganglion like this synapses and then the postganglionic axon continues out to the structure it's going to. So we don't ever see those little ganglia sitting in the walls of organs. Now, I mentioned earlier that sympathetics are often referred to as the fight or flight system. And this is because it produces changes in the body that allow you to expend energy. So it does things like increase heart rate, dilate the bronchi to allow more oxygen into the bloodstream. Uh, it actually slows down the gut to redirect that energy elsewhere, and it increases sweating. It also does a few things that aren't specifically energy related, like innervating the smooth muscles of the eye and the erector pili muscles in the skin. Now, none of these things obviously are strictly linked only to fighting or flighting. They happen for plenty of other reasons as well, but that phrase fight or flight really does a great job of conjuring up that image of getting all worked up. So it's a really handy mnemonic for remembering sympathetic function. So let's take a dive into some of the details of sympathetic anatomy here. Um, we already know that the preganglionic sympathetic neuron has to have its cell body somewhere in the central nervous system. So let's find exactly where that is. We know that it is somewhere in the spinal gray matter, and we know that the spinal gray matter is arranged into dorsal horns for sensory nuclei and ventral horns for motor nuclei. Sympathetics are a motor system, so we're going to look down here in the ventral horn, and it is right here. This green portion is labeled as the motor nuclei 
for the visceral system. So sympathetic is visceral motor, and that is where its preganglionic neuron is going to be located. This is referred to as the intermedial lateral, which we often abbreviate as IML, column of the spinal cord. And this little spot here only exists between spinal levels T1 to L2, so you won't find this anywhere else. The axons of the preganglionic neuron then, so we are back here, these are going to travel out through your spinal gray matter, and because this is a motor system, they are going to go out the motor rate into the spinal nerve and then into the ventral ramus. The postganglionic neurons for the system, like I said, are all hanging out in these peripheral ganglia. Most of these ganglia are part of a long chain of sympathetic ganglia that sit on either side of the vertebral column. So you can see quite a number of these in this illustration here. Um, we've named them for this location. They're called paravertebral ganglia, so para meaning on either side of. And for all target structures that are not located in the abdomen and pelvis, these paravertebral ganglia are where that postganglionic neuron is hanging out. Okay? The organs down in the abdomen and pelvis have a different pathway, and that is well beyond the scope of this course. I do just want to point out, though, that the sympathetics for abdominal pelvic viscera synapse in pre-vertebral ganglia, which is very close to para-vertebral ganglia. So if you're reviewing with an outside source, please be careful not to confuse the two. Para are the ones that sit on either side of the vertebral column. All right, so once synapse has occurred, the postganglionic axon exits the ganglion to travel out to its target structure. There are three ways uh, it can do this depending upon where it needs to go. If the target is somewhere within a spinal nerve's territory, so say a sweat gland in the neck, it can jump on a spinal nerve to ride there. Alternatively, um, it could ride a visceral nerve directly to a thoracic organ, or it could issue joining a uh, solid nerve altogether and ride on the surface of a blood vessel to get where it's going. All right, this last example here, when uh, you have nerves following an artery like this, it's called a perivascular plexus. And this is how almost all sympathetics travel around the head, right? Spinal nerves don't enter up into the head, they stay in the neck. So for these sympathetics to get up into the neck, they jump on top of blood vessels and travel with them to get where they're going. All right, so we know where different parts of the system are located now. So now let's talk about why it's set up this way. Um, as I said before, preganglionic sympathetic cell bodies are found in that intermediate lateral horn of the spinal cord, which only exists between T1 and L2. Right, that is a very limited origin for them. All right, now consider that you've got sweat glands on your face and in your scalp, and I will swear by the shoe stank my children produce that there are sweat glands in the tips of your toes as well. Um, so we find sympathetic fibers traveling along every single spinal nerve from C1 all the way down to the coccygeal spinal nerve. So we have an enormous mismatch between where these things start off, just T1 to L2, and where they spread out to, which is to everywhere. Um, so if you're looking at the image here, you're probably getting a little idea of how uh, these are spread out here. It's going to, your body uses links between these paravertebral ganglia, so notice that these are all chained together here. Um, for fibers to move up and down the sympathetic chain so that they can access the cervical, lumbar, and lower spinal nerves. We call these series of connections the sympathetic trunk or the sympathetic chain. And really all this is doing is connecting consecutive paravertebral ganglia together. So if you look at the photo here, we've got a ganglion and a little bit of trunk. We got another ganglion, a little bit of trunk, another ganglion.
Um, and note here that there is one ganglion for every spinal nerve. And this is going to continue up into the neck and down into the lower regions as well. Every spinal nerve gets their own paravertebral ganglion, even if they're not spinal nerves T1 through L2, okay? Chaining these ganglia together like this does the very important work of providing a pathway for sympathetic neurons to ascend all the way up to the head and all the way down to the toes. It makes for kind of a sympathetic superhighway. <laughs> Now, let's look at the very important details of how this works. So, like all superhighways, we have on-ramps and off-ramps. Here, we're going to call the on-ramps white rami communicantes and the off-ramps gray rami communicantes. If we're talking about one ramp, it's a communicant. If we are talking about multiple ramps, they are communicantes. All right, so let's trace out a pathway here. To get into the sympathetic superhighway, you have to start, of course, way back at the beginning with our preganglionic neuron cell body hanging out in the intermedial lateral horn of the spinal gray matter somewhere between T1 and L2, okay? So that's our red dot here. All right, sympathetic is motor. So its axon will travel out through the ventral root of the spinal nerve and into the trunk. Good. Now, once we are here, we have the option of following either the dorsal or ventral ramus, uh, but only one of these is gonna lead to the paravertebral ganglia. So we're gonna do the smart thing here and we're gonna head into the ventral primary ramus. The ventral primary ramus of uh, spinal nerves T1 to L2 are connected to a paravertebral ganglion uh, by white rami communicantes, all right? That is what this notation means here. It's not a secret code, it's just an abbreviation. So ventral primary ramus of T1 to L2 spinal nerves are connected to the paravertebral ganglia of spinal nerves T1 to L2, okay? Um, our axon then, can travel through this white rami communicans and into the paravertebral ganglion. Now that this preganglionic axon has entered into the sympathetic superhighway here, it can travel up or down between ganglia. We'll talk about this more in depth in just a few slides, uh, but for right now I just want to talk about these on and off ramps. So for our purposes here, we're going to say that this specific neuron's postganglionic buddy, that guy right there, um, is in this exact game glion and they synapse here. All right, the axon of the postganglionic neuron has to get back out of the sympathetic trunk now that the synapse has happened. The gray ramus communicans is our exit. So white brought you in, gray will take you out. And that is going to bring that axon back out onto the ventral primary ramus of the spinal nerve. Um, now, one point I want to make sure I make here is that while these white ramus on-ramps were only in very limited places, so they're only off of spinal nerves T1 to L2, there is a gray ramus communicans associated with every single spinal nerve and every single paravertebral ganglion. So from the first spinal nerve all the way down to the coccygeal spinal nerve. Uh, so this mirrors the distribution pattern we saw previously. So we've got very limited places to get on and lots and lots of places to get off. All right, what we just walked through is one of three pathways that preganglionic sympathetics can take to reach head and neck structures. Um, I also want to add in here that it is completely possible for that postganglionic axon to turn around and head out the dorsal primary ramus as well. They are not restricted to just ventral primary rami. They only have to enter that to get to the paravertebral ganglion. A little confusing. All right, so let's take a look at some other possibilities here for our preganglionic pathways. All right, let's say that the target structure that we need to get to is supplied by a spinal nerve that is lower down in the chain. So let's say it's at T3 instead of T1, all right? Uh, 
So here is <coughs> our pre-ganglionic neuron. We've got our cell body. We've got our axon coming down through the ventral ramus into the trunk, into the, I'm sorry, ventral root to the trunk, to the ventral ramus, white ramus communicons into the sympathetic trunk. Um, our postganglionic partner is way down here. And to reach him, that axon is just going to extend down through the sympathetic chain. It's going to pass through the ganglia in between these. Once it gets to the level that it needs to distribute at, it will synapse with its little buddy there. Okay? After they synapse, then that postganglionic axon will travel back out through the gray ramus communicons and onto the correct spinal nerve that it will distribute as part of. The third and final pathway is very similar and really it just involves going in the opposite direction. So in this case we would need to ascend the chain. So I'll skip the pathway into the sympathetic trunk for the sake of not boring you to tears. Um, the preganglionic axon then is going to continue up the sympathetic trunk to its postganglionic partner. They're going to synapse and the postganglionic axon will exit using the gray ramus communicon back to the ventral primary ramus of its spinal nerve and just like before then it can continue onwards or it can head out to the dorsal ramus. Alright, this final pathway here is going to be the one that you utilize the most in this course. So we are working in the C8 and up region, which means that sympathetics by definition have to travel up at least one level to reach the structures that we're going to be learning about. Alright, so now that you've learned the general rules, uh, let's go ahead and talk about the specific structures we find in the head and neck. So as you can see in this illustration here, the paravertebral ganglia in the neck looks slightly different from the ones that we saw in the thorax on previous slides. These are much bigger and they're more spread out and this is because they fuse during development. Now when I say they fuse, I want to emphasize that they start off as separate ganglia and even after they smoosh together they still retain their individual parts. So even though the uh, superior cervical ganglia which has the ganglia of C1 through C4 all smooshed together, this still has four gray rami communicantes coming off of it and heading out to the individual C1 to C4 nerves. There are typically three fused ganglia in the neck. The superior cervical ganglion that I just mentioned is C1 to C4. The middle is C5 to C6. And the inferior is usually 7 and 8. Now it's worth mentioning that there is a lot of individual variation in the way that these things fuse together. The inferior ganglion very often fuses with T1 as well. And what it does, we call it the stellate ganglion because it looks like a happy little star with all the different rami coming off of it. C5 and C6 may or may not even fuse. Uh, sometimes one of them will fuse with the superior ganglion or the other with the inferior. There's a lot of variation, but this setup with three big cervical ganglion is what you will see most often. Now, before we move on, um, I want to note something very important here about the superior cervical ganglion. So we're talking about this guy right there. Uh, <clears throat> this is the only pathway sympathetic innervation has to enter the head. So your preganglionic axon has to ascend the chain and synapse in here with the postganglionic neuron in order to reach the head. Okay. In our previous examples, we talked about our postganglionic axons exiting through the gray ramus and going about its business on a spinal nerve. But the spinal nerves stay in the neck. They don't go up into the head. The postganglionic neurons here that go to the head do something kind of creative. They leave the ganglion, this part of this little tiny nerve here, and they travel 
with the internal carotid artery. So this guy right here, that's your ICA. Oh, I didn't actually put that on there. Um, so what these are going to do is form what's called a perivascular plexus. Plexus. And that <clears throat> is going to surround the surface of the internal carotid artery as it moves through the head. Um, and that is what is going to distribute these postganglionic fibers to sympathetic structures in the head. Now, because sympathetic innervation to the head travels along such a delicate little strand to meet up with the ICA and then travels as kind of a plexus on its surface, it is unfortunately prone to injury. And injury here will produce a suite of symptoms called Horner syndrome. Now, Horner syndrome is a catch-all for any interruption of sympathetic innervation to the head, not just this specific injury. So it can happen within the central nervous system, at which point we refer to it as first order Horner syndrome, or it can happen in the sympathetic trunk and beyond like we've just been talking about, at which point we call it second order Horner syndrome. Second order injuries are much, much more common than first order. And they are especially and unfortunately common during childbirth when the immature head and neck can get stretched um, and turned and injured. The symptoms of Horner syndrome are essentially a laundry list of what happens when sympathetic structures in the head no longer work. Uh, there is meiosis or constriction of the pupil because the dilator pupillae muscle can't fire to dilate it. There is ptosis or a droopy eyelid, which happens because of uh, the smooth muscles in the eyelid or what we're gonna call the palpebra no longer work to hold that fully open. Um, this produces the appearance of a sunken eyeball. It's not really a sunken eyeball, but it looks like one. Um, a flushing to the skin because the blood vessels are not able to change size and shape. They don't constrict the way they used to. Um, and it also produces anhydrosis or lack of sweating because the pseudomotor, pseudomotor supply to the sweat glands um, has been cut off. So here is a little trick for you as you study. Uh, try using this example to scaffold your understanding of sympathetic structures in your head. Sometimes it's easier to have a suite of symptoms like this to understand um, than it is to memorize all these little individual structures and say, this one is sympathetic, this one is somatics. Um, if you can attach all of these to Horner syndrome, you could rattle off a list of sympathetic structures that are affected in the head without having to think too hard about it. All right, so give that a try. That brings us to the end of the material here. So here is your review question. In order to innervate structures located in the head, a preganglionic sympathetic neuron will synapse in which location? All right, the correct answer is the superior cervical ganglion. Everything going through the head will synapse in the superior cervical ganglion. If you take nothing else away from this video, please take that much. Uh, that is going to bring us to the end, so thank you for joining me.